Scalding. It's available uh, on GitHub. Um, you can follow it on Twitter. Uh, and wanted to thank Stack Mob and also Mercana for hosting this Scala meetup. Okay, so the the talk is going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about Scalding. We're actually uh, going to tell you how we use it at Twitter. When I go into how it's implemented, the extra special sauce that you get this time that you didn't get last time, if you've seen any previous talks, is the in-detail algorithm on how to deal with heavy data skew in your, in your data sets. That's pretty pretty big deal. I kind of alluded to it in the past when I talked about it. How do you walk the graph, the Twitter graph, given that like you know one in 10 people follow Lady Gaga and like one in 10 people follow Justin Bieber, right? You're gonna like something naive, you're gonna hash Lady Gaga to one machine and then like you're gonna send 10% of your edges to that machine. It's gonna be a big disaster. And then Argyris, only like you know one in 15 people follow him and so th that machine won't be like loaded at all. So like how do you deal with that? <laughs> And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about like what's coming up next for Scalding. And the cool thing is like people guilt, guilt us into like doing one thing or another, and you could do that. And the next time we give a talk, maybe your awesome feature will be the next thing, and because like now it's like totally new stuff. So, okay. So um, this is what Scalding looks like. So what's Scalding all about? So Scalding, um, so uh, Scalding came about because. Uh, really, Avi Bryant, who um, is now moving to Etsy and will be bringing Scalding there. They uh, use uh, Scala, uh, sorry, uh, Ruby and Cascading now. They don't use um, Scal Scalding yet, as far as I know. But um, he didn't really want to write Pig anymore. So if you're like really into Pig and like Pig's awesome and you want everything to be SQL, like Scalding's probably not going to be for you. And that, like that's cool. Like everybody can do their own thing. There's a lot of different uh, projects. What what Scalding is all about is trying to make the Scala Collections API somewhat close to like a table model of computation that you would see in a database or in a spreadsheet. There are some people who are kind of like on either end of this picture. So they're like, they're, I'm, I'm going to try to make Hadoop look like a, like a database for you. That's not what, what Scalding's trying to do. Some people are on the other end of the picture where they're trying to make like Hadoop look like just exactly like computing on collections. So they're going to give you a list and you're going to do like reduces on this list. And, you're gonna, and, and, and Scalding's not exactly doing that either right now. So instead that we have this picture. So the idea here is that we have all your, your familiar. So uh, just to get an idea, how many of you like are all like, crazy into Scala already and like, you know, everything you do is a monad and like, you know, everything's awesome, like, you know, life's good, okay? How many of you are like, I heard Scala like might be cool and I know basically nothing about it and it's sort of like Java and I maybe in the future want to do that? So that's kind of more, like, okay, 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 we're dealing with a mix there. So the, the functions that you see here have functions of the same name in the Scala Collections API. So flat map is one of these things that freaks people out if, they're, if they've never heard of it, but it's a, like a really and shockingly useful concept that it's like I want to go through a list, and rather than mapping each item in, in that list onto something, I want to map each item in that list onto a set of things and then glue them all together. And why is this so cool? Like if I gave you just one function, map or flat map, you'd be a fool to take flat map because I could just take, sorry, I'm a fool, apparently. You'd be a fool to take map. Why? Because you could just map each element in flat map to a list of one thing, right? So I can simulate your, your map function with my flat map, no problem. But also I could do a filter. If I only want to keep half the elements, I could map the ones I don't want to keep onto a list of zero items, right? So flat map is like, is like the canonical map in MapReduce that you see in Hadoop. So with just flat map, you're basically good to go. If you just implement that and get it right, you're fine. Okay. So this appears here. So for some ridiculous reason, it must I, I imagine someone wrote the first word count example for uh, map reduce programming. Everyone has to, everyone does this, and because we're I'm unimaginative, really, it's my fault. Um, so this is the implementation in Scalding. So we take a text line. It might be like you know all the web pages in the world and like we're going to look at these line by line and the parallelism comes because this map is fundamentally parallelizable 
And in Hadoop, you'll have a bunch of nodes, 100, maybe 1,000, because Hadoop kind of sucks. It's not like a million nodes, but like, you know, a lot of nodes. Um, and you're going to go through and process all of those in parallel, because the way the algorithm is structured, you know that it must be, you know, there's, there's nothing that can interfere. There's no concurrency problems that are going to show up. So you map each line onto, in this case, all the words in that line. So you can do this in Scalding because you can just inline functions right there. If you're familiar with something like pig or, or you know, um, I don't know, like SQL, you can't very easily just jam your own functions in. Here we're taking this function tokenize, which we define here, and it's a really simple function. It, it, it I don't know, it, um, it replaces anything that's not all these characters with empty space, and then it splits on spaces using a regular expression, just normal Java uh, functions. There are all there in the Java STL, uh, Java standard library on tech, on strings. So once you've done this, you've taken each each line and mapped it onto a list of words. So if it was like "Hello, how are you?", that one line becomes now a list of "Hello, how are you?", right? And then you go on to the next line, and you keep doing that. And so you've glued all these words together into this giant, like very simple list of single words. And now there's a function called group by. This works a little bit different in Scalding than it does in Scala. In Scala, it takes a function, and it says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this thing in your list, and I'm going to map it onto a key. And so like a simple way to think about this might be that I'm going to map, like, you know, we want to sort all the men and women in this room, and the sorting function will return either M or F, right? And that's your group by function. And then you're going to get a mapping that takes M and then the list of all the men, and then F and a list of all the women, right? That's how MapReduce works. It, it basically, it's those two things. You have the map. This is where you do the shuffling. You do this group, and then you do some reduction on it, OK? So in this case, what we're grouping on is the word itself. So each word will be sent to a different list. So we'll have, you know, hello, all the hellos will be in one word, all the hows will be in one word, all the yous will, sorry, all the hellos will be in one list, all the hows will be in one list, all the yous will be in one list, and so on down the line, right? And now we're going to do a really trivial calculation on that list, which is, let me get the size of that list. So now you've changed these all these sentences into this map of word, how long was the list, but the li length of the list was just how many times that word appeared. That's word count, right? How appeared five times. You appeared two times, et cetera. And now you've got that. Now you've got, this, now you've got two columns now. You've got the word column and the size column. And you can keep doing reductions in scalding. You can keep going. You could say, um, uh, we could say, give me the first character in each word and like, you know, I don't know, treat them as numbers and add them all up. You could keep adding more and more reductions and those would all happen in that same reduce phase on, on Hadoop. So this is like awesome. If you don't know much about Hadoop or Scala, it's like, you know, welcome to being lost. But, uh, cause it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like how much can one person introduce in one, in, in one talk? But so finally when we've got that, we just write it out and boom, that's it. So that's it. That's like the, the prototypical word count. Everyone, a lot of people start with that. And that's that. Yes. Yeah, so let me repeat the question. The question was, what is, um, so what are, the, what are the, let's talk about the types here. So if you're in a Scala, you're into types, you want like a strongly typed thing. And so a lot of this is, is, is well typed. So let me answer that question, but then we can move on in a second and talk about some of the bad news uh, like elsewhere. The, the type of, the, of this object is uh, a source that represents like where data is writ, you read or write on Hadoop, right? So that's pretty straightforward. But in between, Scalding is a, uh, a Scala library. It's a DSL for cascading. It's a Java library that you can use in a lot of your voice. And that Java library uses, it represents these computations as pipes, basically things flowing around. You can think of these pipes as like lists. Like I think of them more like lists when I operate on them. And all these objects here are now these pipes. Now, the deeper question is what was going on here. So group by, if you're, if you're new to Scala, this group by took a function. And this function did something, and it's a little bit, I mean, it, it, it's like, it's a slight, it almost looks like a slight of hand if you, if you look at it. But what group by does is it hands you 
a thing that's we, it's, it's like a builder pattern. It hands you this object which you will describe the calculation you're going to build up on the reduction. Because in Hadoop, we don't want to go through the data more than once. We want to only go on, we want to go through it as few times as possible. Once is almost already too many. So if you want to take the average of a bunch of numbers and the sum of a bunch of numbers, and you want to look at the ith element in the tuple and like take the max of those numbers, you don't want to go through that over and over again. In the Scala standard library, to do that, you would be forced, like there's not a really good composition story there. You, you could go through it over and over again, or you could write some function that like goes through this giant tuple and does all these different calculations on it. There's actually a really nice story around it here is that we're taking this group builder thing that has a bunch, all the reduction methods, we'll see it later, and we can do all these different reductions. One reduction is to get the size. Size will return the group builder so you can keep going. We could also say, let me get the max. And you can keep going. Whenever you stop, you're done building up this giant calculation that will run in the reducer. It's not really running here. This is like code you can compile and you would run it and nothing actually happens. It's, this, it's code that returns a calculation. So it's, it's code that's like, it's the output of this code is a calculation. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so this will all get compiled into Java bytecode. Um, behind the scenes, the things that it passes through, this will get serialized using Java serialization. It'll get shipped over to all the mappers in, and the reducers in, in Hadoop. And then they're going to put it through the, the appropriate parts of this code. It's exactly what will happen. Uh, Hadoop and cascading handle that portion of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all ready to go. And by the way, I didn't jump up and down about this any other time I've talked about it, but I probably should. There's this really cool library called Cryo. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you should really look into it if you're not. It's, it's about as fast as Protobuf, which is a lot faster than Thrift. It is as compact as protobuf or thrift, and you don't have to write uh, a definition for your uh, class that you want to serialize in most cases. If you try to do something crazy like serializing an open socket or something, it's obviously not going to work. But for most of the value types that we have in Scala, it just works. It's just So you can jam anything into these things and send them around. You could have case classes. You could do you know, a Scala list. You could pass anything around, and they're just magically going to, almost magically going to work. Yeah. Yeah, I only did this in this case, actually, just to show that you could put an anonymous function up there if you wanted to, or you can call any other function that you like. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just like, it could just be like Bob's your uncle, and like that could have been it, too. It was just to show you that like there's no constraints on what you do. You can send any, any code around. Yeah. K R Y O. Cryo. It's awesome. Also, um, so. So it's also used in Spark if you're interested in Scala and like uh, in memory MapReduce style. Uh, it's also used in Cascalog, which uh, th those, uh, those guys work with us at Twitter um, for our closure version of all of this. Uh, and also Storm uses it. So it's, it's it, and I've heard some people at Yahoo use it. So it's, n it's not like just some crazy dudes using it. Well, in addition to crazy dudes using it. So I think we've kind of gone through all this. You can call these functions. Uh, you can define them in line, or you can call any function that you already wrote. So we're all set to go. So this is pretty awesome. So now the data model, as I mentioned, is that you have a stream of named tuples. Like you can picture this as you're always calculating with like a spreadsheet, and you've got this code that like tells you how to modify the spreadsheet. Okay. So you have column A1, and now I'm going to map on to column A2, and things like this. And it, it's a nice model. Um, but it's, that's where the, you're going to see the difference between um, Scalding and like the standard Scala Collections API. So uh, we can actually run this. And I'll run this in a second. And, and later, we'll go through more examples. But we have this like little uh, driver script that allows you to take your jobs that you write, this Scala job. It'll, in the background, run the compiler, ship it over to our cluster, run it. If, we want to, if you want to run it locally, you can do dash dash local, and it will run it locally as well. And um, 
Pretty soon now, real soon now, um, Edwin Chen or somebody, or maybe you guys, will add EMR support. It's like relatively easy to do that. There's some cascading support for that already. People have done that. That would be awesome if someone else did it. We don't use EMR, so it's not like going to be like top on our list. But it would be so easy and so awesome, and like these demos would be so much better if we could do that. So you guys should, someone get, get on that. But let's give it a try. So how does, how does word count actually run? So pulling some code, going into, so actually. And here is word count. It's the exact same code that we did before, right? So nothing up my sleeve. And then we, uh, I downloaded Alice in Wonderland. So we have Alice in Wonderland, and I'm sure everyone wants to know what the top words in Alice in Wonderland are. Down the rabbit hole, something like this. So we have Scald. This is this little driver script that we wrote. And I want to run it in local mode, and I want to run word count, and I want to have, I have, so that job had two, so it had some args parsing that we built into the scalding, and uh, it, this, we take the input arg, and then we eventually write to the output arg. And the way that that kind of can, canonically works is just with uh, dash dashes. So we just, uh, we run it. So now uh, it's, it's compiling the job. It's linking in some various Hadoop libraries, which may or may not be on your system. And we hacked it up so it magically uh, downloads that from Maven. Um, the Scala compiler is like super blindingly fast. It's just my laptop that's slow. If anyone ever tells you the Scala compiler is slow, they're lying. It's only my laptop. Um, that's a joke for people who actually know that the Scala compiler is crazy, insanely slow. Um, and now let's take a little check at the words. Here we go. So uh, there they are. Uh, I think if we search for Alice, it'll be one of the top words. There we go. Uh, nope, that's not the right one. That's Alice exclamation point. Uh, yeah, I thought we did too, but apparently uh, maybe someone can spot the code, the error in our code. Let's see. Does anyone want to engage in some real-time debugging? Let's see. So anything that is not... It's not totally obvious to me. Yeah, we did two lower as well. I think it's not. Oh, yeah, I don't know. We can open up the repo and play around. Yeah, we're only splitting on spaces, but we're uh, replacing everything in that set with space, right? It's not in that space, right? It's because it's not. So it should. Anyways, there we go. See. I mean, if we can't get this right, I would be very suspect that this whole thing's not going to blow up on you when you try it. But uh, apparently, it works somewhat OK. OK. So that's where we are with that. So um, so what's scalding all about? So scalding has like three sets of functions. And it's these are really like the MapReduce kind of primitives. Yeah. That's a good question for that. Like that's, so the question was, can you run the, the jobs from the REPL? And the answer is, right now, you cannot. And like, so why is that? It would seem like it would be nice and easy to do things from the REPL. But the way that the Scala REPL works is that every line, basically, I, I haven't delved too deeply into it, but they get put in as a, the body of a main method in some anonymous object that gets created at that moment in time. And 
that model breaks like the way that we're threading behind the scenes, this cascading flow that we build up and, get, and then submit to the, the Hadoop cluster. In principle, it is surmountable, but it probably involves writing our own REPL like Spark has done, and that's just something that we haven't done yet. Um, it would be really nice because that we have a lot of we have a, you know we have several implicits which are a Scala feature that that are very useful it's free people out um, that that enable a lot of the DSL and if we had our if we do implement our own REPL we can make sure all those implicits are imported by default and that would make it a little bit cleaner and you could like probably replace it would be nicer to replace the skull that our our Garris has threatened to do this so you can nag him about it he he might actually do this so. So there's three sets of functions that you have. There's really two that really matter, and the last one is built on top of the other one. And you have the map functions. So if you're just used to like like the idea of MapReduce from like maybe you saw it in Python or you saw it in List, there's this map phase that's totally parallelized, and then you reduce it down to one thing. You go through a big list, and you get one value. So how does that picture, if you're not familiar with Hadoop, go in Hadoop? So the idea in Hadoop is that usually you can shard the reducing by something else, and you don't want to reduce down to one value. You might reduce it down like, I want to do a bunch of mapping and then group by a bunch of days, and for each day I want to reduce things down. Or I want to have a bunch of products, and over each of those, say, 100 or 1,000 or a million products, I want to reduce some things down. So in Hadoop, that's the picture. You do the map, you, you define some kind of grouping, and then on the grouping, you're going to do some kind of reduction. And that's where you see all the standard, you're going to see the standard, you know, some you know, average, take, head, sort, whatever that you probably know from um, your, your normal functional programming. There's a pretty decent API on the GitHub page. I'm not going to go through all of it, but we'll see some of it here. Um, but so each of the functions you, you see, the groups you see represented up there, like the map-like functions, the grouping functions, and the join operations. So as I've said about 20 times, uh, usually if you're familiar with the collections API and you can imagine how you'd structure your calculation using Scala collections, you could usually just like say, okay, how would I take that over to Scalding and look up and like, oh, there's that function, there's this function. There's scan, there's take, there's fold, there's reduce, all the things that like if you're used to functional programming, they'll all be there. The only thing that's different is the notion of named fields. So rather than just having a map, you're operating on this, I have this giant tuple that's sitting in the background, and you, when you say I want to map, you say, I, you ask, you tell me which fields do you want to map on? And then I'll take some subset of them and give them to you, and then you're going to map, and then you're going to give some back to me, and I'm going to change that tuple around. So that's the whole picture. So here you see an example where we can use by index, let me get the, the first three elements out of the tuple. And then I'm going to map them onto tuples name these three things. Source, zero, destination, blah, blah, blah. So there's two contexts in which, we, in which so you, you can kind of read that arrow as we're mapping this onto that thing there. The other way that we use the arrow is with the joining operations. And a join is, again, it's lifted from a notion like databases. You don't see this in the Scala API, but I think you should. We should have a co-group. Um, there's group by. There should be co-group, right? Why not co-group? If there was co-group in the, the API, everybody would have a much easier time writing um, MapReduce jobs. But a join, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's weird to, who knows how much everyone's familiar with. But you're just saying, on this list, I've got a bunch of keys. And on this list, some of those keys appear also. And everywhere where the keys appear in both lists, I want to make a cross product. And it just, I mean, it's a pretty simple mathematical operation, but it's very common in databases. And so if you're simulating something like a database or database calculation in Hadoop, it's very useful. And so this syntax here means the source on the left-hand side, I want to, source zero, I want to everywhere on the right-hand side, PR, which is some other thing that kind of comes in, I'm going to map, I want to join those two together and then output tuples that form this cross product. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's it's the same thing you've seen in SQL. Uh, it's uh, co-group in pig. Uh, it's co-group in um, cascading. There we go. So that's how it works. Boom. So I've mentioned cascading a couple times. So what's what's up with cascading? What is its relationship with scalding? So the cool thing about cascading. Um, so there's like three big scalding DSLs for Hadoop. There's like like 
Like I, I heard like, oh, we're, we're Twitter, so we're the, the big one, so which it doesn't seem like. But apparently we're the big one. If you're going to use one, it's Scalding, apparently. We've won. But if you don't use Scalding, there's another one called uh, Scooby, which they have their own flow planner, their own mapping of Scala to Hadoop primitives. Uh, there's also one called Scrunch from the guys at Cloudera, and they have a, a project called Crunch, and Scrunch is like after I uh, told Josh Wills how awesome Scala would be for his Crunch library, he got religion and wrote Scrunch, and so it's, it's awesome too. The difference is cascading has had years of use. I mean, like people have been banging on it for years, and many, many people are using it. The active community is really well tested. The 1.2 branch is like really rock solid. It's a little bit hard to find problems with it. Major problems, at least. You'll, you'll know it. it feel, it's a very safe library. It's going through, we're in about to release 2.0. We still see a couple bugs here and there, but it's a great library. It's really well tested. It's super optimized. It's high performance. So scalding is based on that. You're not like, you know, when you're using it, you're not using like some crazy guy's flow planner who cooked it up last week and it'll be awesome real soon now. It like, it, it works. It's in, it, it's very fast. Um, it's got a fast local mode, which I just showed you. That was not using Hadoop at all. So you can use cascade, you can use scalding or cascading on your cluster. You can then write the same job and run it locally. And that's really handy to be able to use the same concepts and how you um, deal with data for the cluster and locally. It's a real pain if you work with some other systems, you might use something on your, your cluster and then bring it into map, uh, sorry, R or maybe, you know, Excel in some cases locally. That's like, it's like this impedance mismatch, it's no fun. Um, one cool thing is that it has a flow planner that's portable, especially now. So there's two flow planners now, the Hadoop flow planner and there's a local flow planner. But you could easily write a Spark flow planner, which I, I, I really want to push um, Chris Quinsole at, at um, Concurrent to do. Or we've also talked about doing a real-time flow planner on top of Storm. So you could have streaming like uh, batch operations. There's a transactional mode in Storm, if you're familiar with it. It's a kind of a streaming like Hadoop, like a real-time Hadoop, Nathan calls it. And it would be possible to bring cascading to that, and then you could use your exact same jobs in all these different cases. That would be awesome. The bad part is if you're really into like functional programming and you're into type safety and all that, um, cascading's tuple model is basically an array of objects. And so even though Scalding cares about types, it takes your word for it. Like when you say that this is like a, a function that takes a double to string to something, really it's saying, okay, I'm gonna go get a double and a string out of this cascading tuple, but that cascading tuple, it can't can tell the compiler what it's got inside. So that's an unfortunate part about it. That's one thing I don't like about it. Um, the other thing, uh, that is like a little bit of a downside relative to some of the other systems is that Cascading's field model, as I mentioned before, like it, it, it just doesn't mesh well. It's like a record model, that, an untyped record model that doesn't match well with a strongly typed like collections API, like Scala's collections API, or like what you might see in Haskell or something. That having been said, it's like it's really productive. Like, so we have a lot of people who use it every day. We have a relatively large team. They're using it day in and day out. They don't like lose a lot of sleep because like it doesn't have like a, like a lot of strong functional purity to it. And it like, it basically works for them. This model of like tuples and naming columns and everything, it like meshes well with how people think. So I haven't been that like motivated to like do that much about it. So this is just a grep through one of the repos uh, just to count, but we've got like more than 60 in production jobs. And those are jobs that like, if they don't run, we get alerts and like bad things happen that are running on the system. We've got more than 200 just like ad hoc jobs. Someone's just like, hey, you know, how many times did Justin Bieber say I'm gonna, you know, have a beer in the last three days? I don't know, probably didn't say that. Actually, this is going on the web and like, this is gonna make me, uh, I'm gonna get in trouble for that one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, we don't do that kind of stuff. But I mean, like, it's public data anyways. I mean, anyone can see how many times Justin Bieber said that. Anyways, but like, so that, that's not what the 200 jobs are. But like, you get asked a question, you need to answer the question. So like, and they work. So uh, the one thing I don't, I want to give you the impression though, is that somehow it's our only tool at Twitter. I don't want to misrepresent. We've got a lot of people on analytics whom I, I know and love, and they love Pig. So uh, we have a lot of uh, tools there. Uh, the Cascalog guys I mentioned before, they're using cascading. There's another Python DSL inside of Twitter being developed called PyCascading. But, so we're using a lot of cascading, but we also use Pig and a little bit of Hive. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the implementation issues. 
Uh, in a minute, we're going to switch over and do the hands-on. I think I'm going to hand it off to Argyris um, at that stage. But before I do that, we're going to talk a little bit about, like, uh, actually, I, I might even, like, throw it back to the audience. It looked like a lot of people were new uh, to Scala. And if I go in detail on, like, how, like, the implicit work, which is, like, a weird Scala feature, weird to most people who don't know Scala yet, I think we might just, like, like not get the most use out of our time. So I think I might skip that unless people are really interested in like how does the, how do you implement a DSL in, in Scala to like match with like a Java API? Is that like something like, is there like some serious interest in that or should we go to the hands-on? Hands-on, okay. So anyways, these slides will be available so someone can see this, this implicit stuff. So there we go. Um, so before, yeah, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk a little bit about the, the group builder stuff, how the reductions work, and then we'll go to the hands-on. So this is what we're gonna see. So this question came up earlier. What is the type that this the grouping operates on? And the, the type that it operates on is this group builder, okay? And that keeps happening. That's kind of fun if it weren't annoying. Okay, so uh, in this case, we're going to take some, a bunch of numbers. We're going to group them up by this value x. But after we do that, we're going to do a series of calculations on them. The first one is this function. It looks lame. You wouldn't do this on locally because you just it looks makes your code look muddy. But if you're going to do the, go through the list once, you don't want to have to go through and calculate like go through the list five times to calculate all the moments you care about. So we have this function size, average, and standard deviation, okay? So what this thing is gonna do is it's gonna take, grouping, them, grouping the numbers by x, let's take y, and then let me add on three more fields into my tuple. How many values for y I saw, the average value for y, and the standard deviation for y. So now we've grown the tuple out from one element, it had x in it, now it has four elements x, the number of y values for that x, the average number of y, the average value of y for that value of x, and the standard deviation of y for that value of x. And then we can do it as much as, much as you want. I, I apologize for the cut and paste code that this was this from a unit test. So. Um, but you can do it as much as you want. After this, we've got four. Now we've got five, six, seven columns. And now we add one more, we've got eight. At the end, I say, actually, I only want these five. And then they get written out in those five columns. So there you go. So we can do all these parallel reductions at the same time. So you might have like this one object and you might ask a bunch of questions about it. You can keep doing these by adding more and more elements to the tuple inside that grouping. So one function that we have, like the main function that we have, in cascading, a primitive that it offers you to do this kind of parallel reduction, it can be, can be thought of as a map reduce and then followed by a map. So what's going on here is once you've set up the grouping, you might first do some kind of preparatory phase. And then you do a standard reduce on them. So you're combining a bunch of things together. But then when you're done, you might want to clean up. So that's the map, the reduce, and the map. So what's an example of that? So the one I just put up, size, average, standard deviation. I want to take the average of y. I want to get all, all the moments. Let me, I can take like the first 10 moments. How do I prepare? The first step is I take y and I splat it out to all the five moments of y. In this case, it was three moments. The zeroth power, that's one. The first power, that's y. The, third, the second power, that's y squared. Now I do the normal reduce, which would just like sum them all up. And then how do I finish up? Well, once I finish up, I take one. I get, now I've got the count. I've got the sum of all the y's and I've got the sum of all of them squared. And I'm sure at least 95% of you, if I gave you those three numbers, could compute the mean and the standard deviation. The mean's easy. You just divide the sum of y's by the count. Standard deviation is slightly more complicated, but not much, and I'm sure you can figure it out. So that idea that you want to first set up, then do the reduce, then clean up, very powerful. How powerful? Almost everything that we have is implemented this way. If you want to count something that satisfies a predicate, what's the setup phase? Well, if it satisfies the predicate, map it to 1. If it doesn't, map it to 0. What's the reduce phase? The reduce phase is obvious. You add, you do just sum. Sum is a very common reduce function. Um, what's the last phase? Well, that's kind of common. A lot of times you don't have to clean up. So we have uh, an identity function. Is the, man, that is super annoying. 
if I were just like eight feet tall, it would be more convenient. But so at the end, there is a uh, identity function. So same thing with for all. Are all these predicates true for these things? How do I say? Well, I take the function. Is it true for each of them? That's the map. Reduce and all the way through. What's the cleanup? No cleanup. Average, here's like a very complicated uh, algorithm that is a streaming average that's more stable for giant lists. So if, if you add giant numbers to small numbers and you want to avoid round off errors, this is a slightly better algorithm for it. This one actually has non-trivial steps on all of them. You first set up by mapping x to 1 and x. You do this reduction, which is associative and commutative. And then finally, the cleanup is non-trivial. You take the second element of the tuple out. Almost everything that we have is, is, is implemented this way. Why do we do it this way? It can be pushed to the mappers in many cases. It's more efficient if you're all into combiners and MapReduce and all that sort of thing. You can just grip through the code. It's like almost everything is written in terms of that function. So it turns out to be a really valuable function. So now I'm going to hand it over to our guest. He's going to do the hands-on. All right. So let's take a look. If you actually download Scolding from uh, GitHub, we have a tutorials uh, directory that uh, contains a bunch of introductory material that you can use to get a little bit more familiar with the code. And we're just going to walk through a couple of those just so that you can uh, take a look at like the, um, uh, the anatomy of a scolding job and how, it's actually, uh, how you can actually write your own too. Right. So um, how, does a, how do you actually write a uh, scolding job yourself? Um, Basically, all the jobs look something like this. You set up some input source, one or more. You set up an output source that you want to write to. Uh, you do some basic processing on the tuples that are contained within that source, and then you just write the output out. Um, in this particular case, we're not doing anything interesting at all. We're just reading uh, an input file from uh, like a little data file that we have in here, uh, and we're writing it back out without doing anything. Um, the main thing to look at is this text line uh, uh, definition here. This is one of the standard types of sources that is supported in scolding natively. The only two types that we support uh, out of the box right now are text line and TSV. Uh, text line just basically reads text one line at a time and gives you two fields. One field is the line number, the other field is the line. Um, and uh, TSV is basically a source that gives you a set of fields, one per uh, tab separated column inside the file that you're reading. Um, we also have um, additional types of data that we support. Uh, uh, there is uh, another repo that you can download from GitHub called Elephant Bird. Um, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to read data which is saved in HDFS in protobuf or thrift format. So if you guys are basically using uh, protobuf or thrift, you can use that. There's schemes, uh, cascading schemes that allow you to read data in that format too. Um, and um, the main thing to realize about a source is that there's basically two components that, um, uh, ah, damn. Yeah, there's basically two components in the source, and that has to do a lot with how cascading works. One component is the type of the data that is stored in HDFS, and the other component is the path structure inside HDFS. What does that mean? Um, a lot of the data that we have is processed daily. So for example, we, um, we, we have a root directory in HDFS that contains, let's say, for example, the tweets. Um, and then we have a timestamp, let's say by hour or by day, or depending on what your schema you're using, that saves the data for that particular hour, day, or so on. Um, scolding contains a relatively easy way to manipulate dates, uh, which is actually um, a library that we're probably going to spin off eventually in its own, uh, in its own repo, um, that lets you pass uh, command line arguments for like in, uh, start times and end times, and you can limit the amount of data that you're looking at for that particular time region you want to look. Uh, so we have this notion of a time path source, and we have a notion of a fixed path source. Fixed path source just means read everything in this HDFS directory. Time path source means read everything uh, in all the directories that are within this time range. Um, 
In this case, text line is just a fixed path source. It's just basically what we're telling Scolding here is go and read the data that is contained, contained inside tutorial slash data hello.txt and whatever processing you do, just write it in tutorial slash data output zero.txt. Um, is this clear? Okay. Um, now, because this particular example doesn't do anything interesting, we're just going to go and read, a, read the second one, which is a little bit more interesting. All right, so in this case, we'll look at like the first sort of um, you know, non-trivial example of doing something. Um, keep in mind that these types of text line are of type source. Source is like one of the main uh, objects that you deal with in, in scolding. The other main object that you deal with scolding is this notion of a pipe. Uh, a pipe is the object that has all the methods that uh, Oscar was talking about, like map and flat map and filter and so on. Um, the way to transform a source into a pipe is by reading it. So when you call dot read on a given source, what you're doing is you're basically taking the data that is contained in that uh, source and converting it into the subject that you can call all the different map, map and reduce methods on. So for example, here the only thing we're doing is we're taking this text line, we're reading it, this will give us a pipe which will contain the line number and the line itself, and then we're saying all I want to do is I want to get the line, so only the text that is contain contained inside that line, and write it out as an output. Um, Here we're doing something a little bit more complicated. We just want to take every line and reverse it. What this will actually do is it will, um, it will replace the field called line, which is the input field in this mapping operation, with this field called reversed, which is the output of this inline method, which all it does, takes the line, reverses it, and replaces it in that pipe. So again, like the difference of this map, of this map with like, the kind of map that you would call in a Scala collection is that you basically pass it two arguments. The first argument is um, um, this, this tuple two that basically tells it what the input field is and what the output field is. And the second argument is the inline function that tells it what operation perform on the subset of tuples generated from this. Does, does this make sense? All right. So a lot of times when you're writing your jobs, you might want to actually pass input arguments. Um, and the way that we do that is we have our own little arg parsing library, uh, which, is, uh, which is shown in this args object. Uh, so the way that this is done is you can basically treat this args object as a map. And when you are trying, like for example, in this line where I'm picking up the input in line 47, I'm not using a fixed name for the input um, for the input file location, but I'm passing it in through the args object. The moment I, I call the key input on the args object, I am telling the flow planner that when you call, when you invoke basically this job, you have to pass a dash dash input parameter. Otherwise, the compiler is going to freak out and it's not going to work. Um, for the output, I'm still writing in the same place, like just in tutorial data output three. Um, and this happens for, for this particular implementation of job, like I, I just, you know, I can, I can add more arguments if I want to, and that's the way that I deal with input arguments. There are other subclasses of job that will constrain you to also have to pass, let's say, a date as a command line argument. And this args uh, object basically gives you the flexibility to either require something or optionally set it to, null or to none if it's not there. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense. All right, here's a little bit, uh, here's basically an, an example that shows you how a group by works. Um, so in the first three lines of this job, um, I'm just splitting the string by word. So this would be like the first step to a, to a word count, let's say. Um, and here is the grouping that 
Oscar was talking about. Um, when Oscar writes his jobs, he generally likes to use the underscore notation for the, for the anonymous function that you pass to the grouping. Here we're making it more explicit that you know, this is a group builder object that you're passing around and all we're doing is we're doing a size. Um, and again, in the output, I'm not, even though I'm reading from a text line, here I'm writing to a TSV. So this is the TSV that has two columns, one column being uh, the, the word and the second one being the count. So here's an example that shows you how you can actually join. Uh, in this case, we're actually picking up the, the native uh, dictionary file that exists in all Macs. Well, I guess in all Linux distributions, right? Um, too. So all we're doing is we're reading this up as, um, as a number and a score. No, actually, sorry. We're, we're, so here's what we're doing here. This is a file. We can actually look it up. Yeah, so this is just a file that has words and um, and scores. I don't see the scores though. Oh, the scores are the line numbers. Okay, that's cool. And what we're doing here is we're taking the the uh, the field num, which is just a line number, and converting it into a score. I mean, this is a very contrived example, um, but. What we're doing out at the end of this operation is we just have a score and a word. And this is our first pipe, the scores pipe. Uh, then we're getting again the input and we're flattening it out to like to a word. And this step here is the one that is actually doing the work. What this does is it joins one pipe, the scores pipe, with another pipe, the, the, the one that we got from the, from the text line, which is the one that we call the join with larger own. And, um, and the join key is actually the word itself. Um, and finally, we're grouping by uh, the, the, the line itself and just getting for every line the sum of all the scores of all the words that appear in this line. Um, you can imagine doing like more complicated things here. Anyway, any questions? One of the two inputs. The first input was the the dictionary file in uh, in user shared dict words, and the second one is actually user defined. You could pass anything in there. Um, any more questions? So the question is, what the development process is for this? Um, it depends. I think what Oscar ends up doing a lot is we, and actually I, I follow too is we subsample our data sets into small chunks that we can actually fit in our laptops, and we run a lot of these jobs in local mode. And so you have a small subset of the data that you're gonna run over. You first run it on local mode on your machine, see that everything works, and then you, um, and then you ship it over and try to run it on your cluster. Uh, the good thing about this, and I don't know if it became very clear when uh, we gave the talk or like throughout this talk, is that because of the way that cascading works, you essentially have three stages to your job. The first one is compilation, the second one is flow planning, and the last one is actually when it, like the, the running phase. Uh, so in the compilation phase, you can like, you know, catch like stupid errors or whatever, like stupid bugs uh, when it, your job doesn't compile. In the flow planning stage, what the, what the flow planner will actually do is we'll see that all the fields of all the tuples that you're defining create a flow that makes sense. If that doesn't happen at that point, no job will be scheduled and it will fail at that stage. Um, you can also get failures in the, in the um, let's say in the running stage if you have like something like a null pointer exception or some other, or a bug that we have in code or something like that. Um, but the good news is that most of the errors will be picked up in the, either in the compilation page or the flow planning stage. So that helps a lot, like that helps you save a lot of time. Um, yes. So flat map takes two arguments. The first argument is a tuple two of from fields to two fields. And the second argument is an anonymous function that uh, goes from um, a tuple of the same size as your, um, as your input fields, with the exception being when you have a field, like just one input field. Um, with the exception being when you have only one input field, in which case instead of a tuple, it's just gonna be one field. And the output uh, of that anonymous function has to be an iterable. Um, so 
what flap map will do is it will create a tuple which will be a s created by the subset of the fields that you define in your from field and populate the two fields with, uh, with, uh, with the output of your anonymous method. Th does this make sense? So the question is, does flat map create the, number, the same number of rows? The answer is it doesn't. Um, yeah, the, the answer is it doesn't. Uh, it creates, so for every row that is processed, it creates as many rows as the output of the anonymous function creates. So, so if your anonymous function creates, gives back a none, it's gonna create zero rows. I wanna, so the question is, is the, is the pipe gone? Does the, what happens when you operate on it? The pipes are always immutable. So you can kind of think of them as frozen in time. They're never gonna change. So when you take this pipe and then you flat map over here, you're creating a new pipe that is gonna be larger or smaller, who knows, because the flat map can shrink or grow the number of elements. What I was just typing while Argyris was, was talking about flat map was an example in the Scala repo where I took a, a list of two things. You can think of that as a pipe that has two things. It has two strings, uh, you all everybody, and is a lyric from Lost. And what I did was I did this, the normal, uh, the, the word count flat map that we keep seeing up there. I did the exact same one. And you see that it returns a list that says, you, all, everybody is a lyric from Lost. If you count that, if I do dot size on it, you see there's eight things now. So we started with two lines. We flat mapped it out, wound up with eight lines. The total analogy of this, we could we could also do this with with a. I could have done. Sh sh sh. So here's. Um, oh man. So I can capture this as. On top of all the stuff that this awesome high tech computer is doing, it's also playing some Thelonious Monk in the background that no one's listening to. But um, there we go. So there's this. It's not really a pipe. It's a list. But now we do the flat map on it. Flat map. You know line to line dot split, Shh. same kind of code that we've done. And now let me capture this in a new pipe, val new pipe. This would be the kind of code that we would write in Scalding all the time. Now new pipe, when you take a look, that's the one that has a size of eight. And if I group, you know, you can do a group by in, in Scala as well. I can group by, I don't know, like uh, take the, the word and, and get the zeroth element out of that. Oops. And that makes some big mapping, whatever, but uh, all that's there. But now notice pipe is still untouched. Pipe still looks the same. And that semantic, those semantics still work the same in sculpting as well. So that data, I, I could also do something like pipe dot um, make string and glue this all together into one big line. And that didn't change the fact, like, Actually, that was a bad example because you get the same result whether you did it on the first or second pipe, but whatever, you know. All right, let's see if this works. So, um, wait a minute. Okay, so let's try to run this example. As we said, like, the first uh, input that we're passing is this dictionary file, um, and the second one that we're passing is, you're right, it did finish compiling, is um, this one, this hello.txt file. Let's take a look at this. It just has four words, so it's not necessarily that interesting. <laughs> but let's run it anyways. So, one mode that we're doing here is we, um, we don't need to compile the whole world every time we want to run a job. Um, something that we do to make everything a little bit faster is uh, we keep around like an assembly jar that we've built with all the necessary sources that we need. And every time you run like the driver script, skull.rb, what it does is it compiles a thin jar for this particular Scala file for your job um, adding that into the class path, like your big assembly jar into the class path. So that makes compilation time much faster for your little job that you want to run and you want to run a little bit quickly. Um, so, yeah, so that means that, yeah, so that basically makes things a little bit better. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> so this is the output. The line goodbye world, if we sum the scores for goodbye and world, we'll get 
232,500, sorry guys, I can't speak. And uh, for Hello World, we'll just get 315,975. So yeah, that's the output. Um, any more questions? <laughs> Oh, that's a very good question. What's this scolding gen script about? Um, so, as Oscar explained, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we are converting cascading tuples into Scala tuples, just make, to make the whole DSL feel much more Scala-like. Um, and that actually requires doing a bunch of implicits for each one of the tuples from 1 to 22. So, there were two ways to do this. Either we would take the same code and copy-paste it 22 times, or we write a little script that generates the code. Um, so that's what it does. And in fact, one of the um, um, like more, let's say, experimental features that we are about to release is this whole notion of an abstract algebra. Uh, this is something that Oscar worked on a lot. The idea being that if you define the, the notion of a, of, a, of a monoid and the notion of a group and the notion of a ring, uh, then the operations that you need for each one of those is like you know, a zero and a plus and, a, and then you need like a, a, a times and a one and all these things. So you could, for example, define a plus operator for two tuples, right? I just sum all the, all the different uh, fields inside each one of the tuples together and that's it, right? I just call plus on each one of those. And you can have like nested monoids and so on and so forth. So this would be very useful for doing things like reductions on multiple fields at the same time. Uh, so, but in order to do that, again, you need to do all the monoid implicit conversions for each one of the tuples from tuple one to tuple 22. We had to generate a bunch of code for that too. So because like, you know, our scripting language of choice is Ruby, the gen scripts are Ruby scripts. Um, does that answer your question? Cool. Please. So it's not really like, so the, the question is if there's any best practice in terms of the number of joins that you do within a job. Um, actually, what ends up being a little bit more critical is how much data skew there is in a given join that you want to do. Um, the thing is, if those joins are different joins that are happening, the cascading flow planner is going to be smart enough to break those up into a, a very, like a different number of map reduced steps. Uh, so. If you're doing too many, what will end up happening is the whole flow will take like a lot of time to run, but nothing bad will happen. Um, also, keep in mind that none of the like if you actually want to access any of the data uh, and actually read it and do stuff based on it, like you want to have some logic or you want to run a loop where a job will con will rerun if like some for example you're running something like PageRank for example, um, then. You can't do that at the flow planning stage. You have to wait for your flow to complete and then access the data, read it, and decide whether you want to keep going. So that could be a limiting factor. Um, now, if you have issues with data skew, we're actually in the process of implementing um, a skew join. Um, we have this notion of what we call a block join that, yeah, that, that I could talk about if you want to, but. Um, what that basically does is it helps you do joins of, of pipes that where like some of the keys would hash into the same reducer and like that would cause a lot of the data to go to the same reducer and everything would take forever to run. Um, oh, um, so how does scolding know if an operation is not associative? Um, well, the only, like we have a couple of operations that are not. So if you actually look at the group builder code, we implement logic for um, how to do a particular operation in a way that would be associative or in a way that would do everything at the reducer. And the moment you add an operation in the group builder that is not associative, at that point we cancel any map side aggregation and we push everything at the reducer. So we keep track of that. And the moment you try to do something that would break the associativity, we just give up and say, okay, that means we need to push everything to the reducer. An example of that would be something like a fold left that would need to go through every um, element inside your group. Uh, you can't do that from a, from a map side, right? The like, let's say the, the, the main, um, like functions such as sum or average or average, sum average standard deviation or map reduce map, those retain associativity. So as long as you're using those, you're good. Um, there are other methods like fold left or scan left or sort. Which other ones do we have? They're fixed in the library. Yeah. No, you can't. Yeah, 
And there's another list of functions that are not associative. And the moment you use any of those, you just broke an associativity. So, yeah, that's a really good example. Um, actually, we rarely and maybe never deal with data that is text in Twitter. Like, almost all of the data we deal with is either Thrift or Protobuf. Um, the thing is that we haven't pulled that as a dependency inside the scolding project itself because we didn't want to make it too heavy. Uh, but there is another project called Elephant Bird, and it's quite easy to, to pull in that and... And, and use that to, to be able to read uh, and write to, to, let's say, for example, LZO compressed uh, Thrift and Protobuf. Just to answer your question, the, the code looks exactly the same. Like, nothing changes. You just make a few definitions about your source, and then the rest of the job looks exactly the same. Yeah, it's, it's basically a different implementation of a, of, a, of a source. Yeah, that's all it is. Um, yes? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, you can take that one. Man, Sam is going to love this. So Sam Ritchie is uh, one of the guys from Casklog, and he works at Twitter also, and we're always, like, you know, trying, you know, Sam's sitting there trying to convert you over to using Casklog, which is, like, a closure version of, like, cascading, and then we're over here, or maybe me more than, Argyris isn't the, the, the zealot that I am, maybe, but um, trying to preach the gospel of scalding, and, but we've agreed to collaborate on some subset of things, so Meat Locker, Cascading Cryo, we have, like, a whole, like, uh, GitHub slash Cascading is a bunch of projects, and a lot of those are just, like, Sam and us and Chris Winslow from Concurrent. And so uh, Sam's some, like, uh, you know, former Olympic rower, like, CrossFit crazy dude, and we were joking about something, some about putting cryo stuff in the freezer, and we, were, we have to give things names, and people hate code names, and it became Meat Locker. And it's so awesome that Meat Locker gets brought up as, like, a big question. This is awesome. It's Twitter's secret strategy to destroy Facebook. That's really the answer. He didn't just say that. Anyway, um, yeah. So yeah, does that answer your question? It's it, so what we're doing is we're basically breaking off pieces that are common to projects that use cascading but are written in different languages, and we're just trying to use these around. So that's that's the part of serialization that Sam pulled out into its own project. And, uh, what, what I was trying to bring up here was an example of how would you go about like doing thrift, like, um, and so here. So we have these, this is, this is code that's not been released yet. There's no reason why it shouldn't be or couldn't be, but it's just not yet. And so if you wanted to implement your, this yourself, you can see it's like five lines of code. And you basically say you wanted to find a new, uh, like in this case, we make a trait for LZO compressed protobuf, and we say that the H, there's a scheme, this is a notion from cascading, is the LZO protobuf schemes. And these guys are defined uh, somewhere up here. Those, uh, these are defined in the Elephant Bird project. That is open source. So you can download that. That's another Twitter project. And it's like five lines of code to adapt it to being. So the, the schemes are cascading schemes. But it's like, like I said, I mean, that's literally five lines of code to make it a scalding source. And then you're good to go. So we could, we could release this file or whatever. But um, And this is just like Argus was mentioning. If we want to deal with dates, we've got some, some logic around that. But yeah, it's pretty straightforward. That's actually, so the question is, is there a way to define a mapping from, let's say, Thrift or Protobuf uh, fields into, into cascading fields? Awesome question. The answer is yes. You can do that in one line of code. Uh, we have uh, methods called pack and unpack. What unpack does is, it's a little bit dirty, but it works, so I like it. Um, what it does is it uses reflection on the field name to call the right getter on, on the Protobuf object or the Thrift object and takes it out and puts it into the field with that name. Um, the, the good news is that it doesn't do that at runtime. It does that at flow, uh, at, at flow um, scheduling time. So it will check whether those getters and setters exist in your, in your object. And if they don't, it will fail without scheduling any job. So it's dirty, but it's not as dirty as it sounds. So um, that's what unpack does. It gets out the, the field. Unpack will do the opposite. Like if you've named your fields the right way, it will actually use the cascading, sorry, the thrift or protobuf setters to set them into the object. So you don't need to write a bunch of boilerplate code to instantiate the object, put everything in and put it out. You just do it like that. So. Well, by the way, you don't have to operate that way. You can, these objects can just pass along the whole thrift object to you. The tuple, the fields can contain a whole object. 
So like our like you know log entries might have like a hundred like they might be a thrift object with like a hundred fields inside. They don't have to be flattened out into tuples. They can you know you can pass those objects around through your pipes. So it's not like pig or something that only has primitive elements in the tuples. You can also have your thrift object right in the tuple. So the pack and unpack is there when you want to flatten it out, but often is the case that you want to just compute directly on the object itself. Cool. Thanks, guys.